this week's episode, we want to thank a couple of our Patreon supporters. Thank you, Shelby, Chelsea, Eleanor, Stephanie, and Kara. We appreciate you and the things that your support helps us do, like fund this podcast and hire some paid staff writers for sartorialgeek.com. If you want to join them, head to patreon.com slash sartorialgeek, and we will love you forever. Hey there, I'm Andrea here with my co-host Megan, and we want to tell you about our new podcast, Crying at Disney. If you've ever wondered who designed the Haunted Mansion, or why all the electrical boxes in the parks are painted a certain color, if you daydream about attractions that were never built, or sit at home watching ride-through videos, if you're constantly ranking your favorite rides, or ranking the animatronics you think are the hottest, and especially if you've ever just been so overcome with the magic of it all that you broke down into tears, then you might like our podcast. Look for us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on social media by searching Crying at Disney. See you real soon. Hello, welcome to the Sartorial Geek Podcast. I'm Jordan Ellis of Jordan Denae, and I am so excited that I'm finally sitting with Victoria Schwab, aka V Schwab. (laughs) This is the coolest thing that we're like Oh, actually doing this podcast I'm right so, now. I'm so happy that we got to do this. I love any occasion to just spend time with you. That, like, it still feels a little surreal to me that we actually <laughs> work together. Like, our, this collection is definitely the thing that the most people are like, I can't believe you've met her. <laughs> like, it's so great. And I also can't believe I've met you, which is I awesome. I love it. It's been, what, about a year and a half since we first sat down yeah. at San Diego Comic-Con to plan. Yeah, and then it came out at, like, the soft, the teaser was at New York Comic Con last year, which oh, is my so goodness. cool. Time is moving so quickly. Yeah. I'm already like, we have to find something new to do. I know. Well, <laughs> and I mean, that won't be hard because you have literally the most going on I have at all times. I do. <laughs> I think I'm, I'd rather be overwhelmed than underworked. Yeah. Like, I think I have a very large fear of having any time alone with my thoughts like my publicist just suggested she was like maybe you could just veg out for a couple days and I gave her such a look of stricken (laughs) horror at this suggestion because that's kind of one of the difficult things about having a lot of irons in the fire is you you don't feel entitled to humaning time but Mm -hmm. I love I love being drawn in a a dozen different directions I mean I think it also takes a special brain to be able to do that like the number of things you have going on because you've written so many books in like not that long of a time 16 in just about nine years that's wild (laughs) (laughs) and then like you've been teasing that you have hollywood things going on which is a separate thing it's a whole separate thing but i do think and it varies from person to person i am pretty involved in all of my hollywood things and i always say as many things as you think are going on there's usually like a lot like i've had a thing in the works for three years i haven't been able to announce yet i have i think six projects currently in development and i've only announced one and that's shades of magic that's so amazing yeah. and I'm sure like very very hard to keep all that because you're actively writing too yes and I hate secrets <laughs> I hate secrets not because I hate what they represent I hate secrets because I'm really bad at keeping them um which is like evidenced by the fact that the moment you walked in I was like hello let me tell you all of the things I haven't Before been allowed to tell the internet the <laughs> exactly no that I mean that's fair, but you are actually good at keeping them, so congrats for doing <laughs> that. I have NDAs and continually yeah. people who would be very, very angry at me. I guess that's good motivation um, to do it. But I've definitely looked at my phone a few times over the last few weeks and just thought, I mean, what if I just, like, how much of a, like, could I phrase a secret in such a way that I couldn't get in trouble for revealing it if I wasn't specific enough, but was just specific enough that people could figure it out themselves i would say like you maybe could except that your fans are so perceptive like it is. even so i love i love when you tweet something and then or instagram anything the reading the comments like your fans are so obsessed and know everything they're quite attentive i remember a list i put a list a teaser list up of projects that i was working on and i only used either acronyms or like fake titles and within Within an hour, somebody had guessed that BOS stood for the third city of ghost books, and they had guessed Bridge of Souls. And I was what? like, how in how God's name possible? have you done that? Like, they are, they're little sleuths, and I do love, I do love everybody. I love that they feel passionate enough to go sleuthing with me, because I do think, like, 
I am so passionate about all of it. I, I am so lucky and so fortunate to have this job and so passionate about what I'm doing and to have readers who mirror that back and, and, and reflect it many times over is just one of the coolest luxuries of this. It's so awesome. And like there, you have a hand in so many different things and it's cool that like your fans follow, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. you don't even write for the same ages all the time. That no, I, I just did the tunnel of bones tour and it was so cool. Cause I had multiple moms come on that tour holding like shades of magic or vicious and they had their child with them and the child had city of ghosts. And I felt, I felt That's intensely cute. powerful. <laughs> I felt intensely powerful because I just thought this is generational. Like this is multi-generations of readership happening here. Um, and I'll have like 45 year olds reading City of Ghosts and 10 year olds reading Shades of Magic. I'm very, I'm very explicit in that I don't feel like, I feel like books have a lower age limit, perhaps like puzzles yeah. do and no upper age limit, but it is really rewarding. And now I just have to write a picture book because then I'll catch them You'll at the youngest the whole age range. and then I'll just yeah. never let them go. Yeah. I think that's amazing. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. It's. I think, like, part of the reason, I mean, your fans obviously love your work, but also, like, you give so much to fans, too. Like, you are active, and your your social media is you. Like, yeah. it doesn't feel like you're sitting, you know, behind, like, a glass, and it's like, here, take what I give you, and that's it. No, absolutely not. In fact, so I'm 32 now, and I started in publishing when I was 21, and there was no transparency whatsoever. There just wasn't. And I remember feeling so isolated and so alone with my feelings. Because the fact is, like, writing is hard. It's amazing, yeah. but it's also hard. And self-doubt can be brutal. And creativity has hills and valleys. And then I remember going to a writer's retreat about six months before The Near Witch came out. And everyone was talking about how hard writing was in person. And I said, why don't you put any of this online? I wouldn't feel lonely if I knew that I wasn't the only one going through this because publishing makes such an island of you. And they were like, oh, well, we don't talk. You can't talk like this online. And and I just thought to myself, one, I don't really like being told what I can and can't do. I'm kind, yeah. of, I'm kind of adversarial in that way. But also, if if being honest online means that one aspiring writer feels less alone in the creative process, then it's absolutely worth it for me. And so really from there on, from the beginning, it has always been about transparency for me. And it's a thing I've had to, and I'm still learning how to kind of mediate along with having a large audience and a, a really large online following, but I refuse to lose that entirely. I might have to pick and choose a little bit more when I get to have those honest conversations on the internet because things get taken out of context so easily. And, um, you know, I don't want to ever be disrespectful to people, but it's very important to me and to my own personal identity that I'm honest. I think that is so refreshing. And like, I know, I know what you're talking about because I have the same thing in businesses where it's like, no one posts when they're having a really bad quarter. Cause yeah. like you, you just don't do it. But then when you get to have those in-person moments, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, we're all going through the same thing. Why do I need to have this group of peers for, like, what yeah. about when well, you're just starting? And I, I mean, I have found, I had some readers, some authors reach out to me at various stages and be like, you're, this is going to kill your career. Like, you should not do this. People want it to be romanticized. Don't, like, you're going to hurt your audience. You're not going to have as many followers. And the exact opposite I found happened, which is that when readers saw how much went into writing a book, when we didn't pretend that it was all gloss and glitter and romance, yeah. when we showed the underbelly of creativity, readers on the contrary valued the end product more. And I know this because several tours in, readers started to come up to me on tour and instead of saying, I'm so happy, they would say, I'm so proud of you. And that That's seems so cool. like a minute shift in, in word choice, but what it's saying is that they feel personally invested in the process. And, and I, I'm sure that somebody looks at that if they've just started following me and thinks, oh, she's doing it because she wants readers to feel more invested so that they'll buy her books. But the, the honesty came first and the commitment and support came after. And now obviously I foster and nurture that support and it feels very validating because every now and then a publisher reaches out and is like, please stop being honest. And I'm like, no, like yeah. the fact is at every event that I do, I have aspiring authors and published authors and artists and people in various creative fields come up to me and say, 
I love your books, but I want to thank you for your online conversations. And yeah. that to me is worth it. And it's so cool too, because I mean, like you were saying, when you feel isolated, you feel like everything that goes wrong for you, it's just you. Yeah. Or like every no is Well, like... you feel like it's a reflection on your abilities instead yeah. of the industry. When you feel like you're the only one hearing negative feedback and you don't know that that's part of it, that that's part of the industry, that's part of creativity, that that's part of the hills and valleys of, of the art form and of publishing, you begin to equate that self-doubt and that negative feedback with your own abilities as a creator. When yeah. it's not, it is part of it. And I remember early on asking Neil Gaiman on Twitter, um, do you still feel self-doubt? Like, how can a person who has so much guaranteed success at this point, yeah. who knows that no matter what he puts out, people are going to love it and read it, like, do you still feel doubt? And he said, every blank page. And I think it's a matter of knowing that your heroes and your peers also feel those things. And it really breaks my heart that there's so much pressure. Now, I think there has to be a balance. I make sure that, like... I never want people to think that I'm ungrateful for what I do have, yeah. but it would be incredibly disingenuous if I didn't, if, if I wasn't honest about the fact that for me, especially it's hard one. Yeah. It's hard one. And I have had a writer say to me before, if you don't enjoy it every day, then you shouldn't be doing it. And like, that's just a fallacy. Like it's yeah. such a creative fallacy. And I don't want anyone to quit because they feel like they're alone in this. I've read that from a lot of, I think that's a, a myth or whatever, a lie about creative jobs where yeah. it's like, oh, you're doing what you love. Yeah. Still you a job. Every second. Yeah. And like, you have to do parts of it that I, you don't want. I always love. say you it's a to. dream job and that yeah. means it's still a job. And that means that maybe I hate my job 40% of the time instead of 80% totally. of the time. That's my definition of a dream job. It doesn't mean that there aren't days, especially in something like writing where there's so much necessary vulnerability in order to get the story on the yeah. page and like I, I just again I don't want to lie about it I want to be honest and the truth is like for me writing books is really super hard and there are a lot of days when I think I'm just going to move to Iceland and raise goats but I'll, I'll be honest like I, my, I live in Scotland my family lives in France and when things are getting really hard I will take a train down to my family so that I can like chop and stack wood that's because great. they live on like a you know little cottage in the middle of the countryside and they need to chop and stack wood and the fact is that chopping and stacking wood is the exact opposite of writing books yeah you the amount of effort that you put in directly correlates to what you see out of it and the fact is one of the things that makes writing so difficult and so grueling is that it's not like chopping wood it's not um you can put in so much and you can get nothing out except obviously the story but in terms of from a professional aspect you can put so much in and it can be the wrong time or a different title got prioritized or you just didn't find the right agent or the right editor. And it can be very disheartening to continually have to put yourself out like that. And even, you know, it's it's a dichotomy of even when things go well, that is just as stressful for a neurotic person like myself because you're just waiting. Where something yeah. goes well, the better your book does, the more nerve wracking the next book becomes. Because there's so much more pressure, totally. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I would be lying if I didn't fight with these things. And so I fight with them honestly and transparently in order to, in the hopes that if somebody else, anyone else is going through that, they realize that it's not unique. And hopefully in it not being unique, it's it hurts a little bit. The knife goes a little bit less deep. Yeah, I loved, I don't remember exactly when, but at some point you posted like the realities of being an overnight success yeah. and you posted like these are every the single one yeah that came out yeah. like before and then you know I wrote that back in I think 2016 um when I walked into a British bookstore for the first time and saw I had like a display and um and I think about it a lot because I'm still fairly young though I definitely had an existential crisis when I turned 30 What's and my, <laughs> my yes. friend no my friend <laughs> pointed it out so perfectly I was like this isn't fair like why am I having an existential crisis and she said because when you hit 30 you can't be a prodigy anymore you're just an adult who's good at their job and, yeah. and I definitely feel that but because I am as you said I have a lot of books considering my age um I think about it a lot but anytime you know I gain a certain number of followers online every day those followers don't know they're coming in and I could yeah. be I could have this could be my debut novel or this could be my first or second they don't necessarily do a deep dive and it can always be really amazing and kind of maddening when you see people behaving like I just came out of nowhere because yeah. I think 
pretending like somebody just came out of nowhere, mythologizing that process really is a huge disservice to the work that it takes to get there. And I think it's really easy to be like, yes, I did just do this overnight. Yeah. And like, thank you for noticing. But it's it's more honest to be like, no, I did put in a decade of work. And like, I have released these books before yeah. to not the same numbers as I am now. And like, yeah, you know, it's weird. There are stages. It's also just the difference between writing and publishing. Like, yeah. there are two different industries. Totally. I would say writing is magic. Publishing is not. No, but I think that is that is a distinction that doesn't get made that often where it's like the writing doesn't change just yeah. because the publishing didn't go the way yeah. it could have for any number of reasons. And it's not a meritocracy. We love to pretend that the more money a book gets, the like more worthy it is. Yeah. Uh, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's, there are so many factors. There are so many factors. I feel like we're like, sort of toying at like how much advice you have for new writers I'm just gonna ask <laughs> yeah, like um, what is your best advice well for writers who haven't like for there I have writing advice and I have publishing advice okay. right and I do feel like these are different things yeah. my writing advice is figure out an ending because I'm somebody who if you couldn't tell already is very prone to quitting I'm like constantly I don't quit but I'm constantly fighting the urge to give up and the best way that I've found to overcome that or see through it is to have an ending. When you have an ending, instead of trying to cross a desert, you are trying to cross a field. It's still a distance, but you're not going to get lost and you have something that you're moving toward at all times. I find that to be one of the best things that can happen if you're somebody who gets halfway through a story and loses hope. Mm -hmm. Because you can fix the rest of the book, but if you have an ending that you're excited about, on good days you're going to look forward to getting there, and on bad days it's going to keep you from quitting. So even if it's not your final ending, like I write my books backwards, so I in 16 books the endings have never changed. The rest of the book has changed, so the endings haven't. But even if you just need a placeholder ending, come up with an ending that excites you, because one, endings are the taste left in your mouth at the end of a story. We retcon the entire rest of our experience based on that ending, so they do carry a lot of weight, but it will hopefully propel you toward that end, especially as we get towards like NaNoWriMo. Yeah. Highly recommend that people who are starting NaNoWriMo have an ending in mind to help propel them forward. My publishing advice is a little different. It's twofold. One is to remember that it is so rare that a single book defines a career. We are, the vast majority of us, the result of a body of work. The other advice that I give, because that's more of a reminder, is to not be afraid of rejection. I think we see rejection as such, again, a merit-based thing, when the truth is that rejection is part of the game. It never stops. I got rejected for something like two days ago. Like, it's a sign. Which, it's just a, I know, I know. Is, it's, it's a, so crazy. It's a cost of participation. Like, rejection yeah. exists to test not only your craft, but your mental state. Mm -hmm. It exists to see if you are ready to move to the next step. And that has half to do with your book, and that has half to do with how you handle the act of being rejected. Yeah. You have to learn to see rejection as simply the price of admission into playing this game. And, and... I mean, I'm, I'm always shocked when I find out somebody, you know, spent a year writing a novel. They managed to muscle through from beginning through middle to end, which is such a hard feat. They get three or four rejection letters and they're out. Yeah. And what that tells me, one, it makes me very sad, but also it tells me they would never have survived this industry, which is an industry at which rejection is company like a shadow at every single step of the game. So just figure out whatever mental gymnastics you have to do to not take rejection personally that's such good advice and like <laughs> i feel like it is so refreshing to hear someone who has made it talk yeah. about how that's still a part of like it's not like you saw a certain number of books and no. then no one ever says no again no i think i mean and they shouldn't i say to people like if you stop getting rejected something is wrong because you are not reaching anymore you know like yeah. i get rejected because i'm constantly still striving for things that i haven't gotten yet if I just oh, stayed cool. in my lane and just wrote the same thing over and over and over again that I've been writing and stayed in the safety of that, I probably wouldn't get rejected very often. But the metrics, the metrics of success are always changing. You can't control them. So you have to learn to make some peace with being told no. 
feel like that's like the perfect ending. Yeah. I have had goosebumps this whole time. This is, so, <laughs> this is so cool. And I'm not even a writer, and this is so inspirational. But I feel like these things relate to every creative profession. They relate right. to musicians, they relate to creators, to you know, to business owners, they relate yeah. to all of it. Anytime where your worth and your work become entangled. Yeah. So amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much of for like course. sitting down and chatting. This has been <laughs> the coolest thing. I feel like everyone knows where to find you, but yes. just in case there's someone you can new. Find me on the Twitters and on the Instagrams at V E Schwab. V E S C H W A B. So awesome. Thank you so much. This has been incredible. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, you can head to our archives to hear more or hit subscribe to hear what's coming up next. If you want to go a step above and beyond, you can leave us a review on iTunes, which helps other nerdy people find us. Or you can go to patreon.com slash sartorialgeek to help keep the podcast going and check out the cool rewards that we have over there. Have a great week and stay nerdy. Bye.